the science and get some community engagement to help them gain the tools to, to, to effectively sample for us to identify hot spots in lead and eradicate them and for us to provide services back to the community, right? Uh, the community doesn't have a $100,000 instrument to detect lead in the environment, okay? I do, but I don't have access to people's backyards. They do. So the combination is where I think the magic meets as you're meeting uh, the university's need to advance science and the community's need to advance and better themselves. And if you can make those work together, it's wonderful. So during this talk, I'm going to I'm going to tout successes. Of course, why would I give a talk if I was an absolute failure? I'd still be in Indiana. I wouldn't be here in uh, in Cairns. But uh, to talk about some of the, the successes, some of the pathways that, that I found, um, I've been able to make some headway in, not just individually, but as an institution, and uh, and also really for full disclosure, talk about some of the challenges that face, certainly in the US context, institutional challenges. You might find some of them are the same here in Australia. And I would love to hear about those that are the same and maybe those are a little bit different. I've given this talk at a couple other universities here and I find that some of, this, some of these things resonate. Okay. I'm gonna have this roadmap up toward the end to see if I actually did a good job or not. The reason why I'm led is a critical uh, issue to deal with right now is that it's, as I mentioned, it's still lingering in the environment and it permanently poisons kids. And as Dave said, it even kills kids in, in Nigeria and other places, right? Uh, lead is a very powerful neurotoxin, meaning that if it's in your body, uh, it, your body can, it does not distinguish between lead and calcium. Calcium is a very important neurotoxin in our neurons. That's the way that our, our chemical uh, information gets back and forth. Lead looks just like uh, calcium to our body. So it pretends it's, it's calcium, but guess what? It's not calcium. And the, the way that this, uh, this manifests as an adult, if, if any one of us were lead exposed right now, um, and people are lead exposed even as adults, both in industrial applications and in shooting ranges, um, you would exhibit a couple symptoms. Uh, one of them, usually it doesn't get to the toxicity level, but usually you start um, noticing some forgetfulness, some memory loss, some increased address, uh, aggression, and some lack of focus. That's because you have so much lead in your brain that your lead keeps popping into the neural sites that are supposed to be sending these important signals and it, the signals never get sent. And if you were then removed, if you guys as adults were to remove that from that source of lead, it would recover. You'd recover nearly completely. There's some indication that you never actually recover completely as an adult but mostly completely. With children, it's an absolutely different story. And that's why I show this picture. This is two brain scans from something called the Cincinnati Lead Study. They found they, uh, they mapped out the long, longitude of the long-term life course of about 180 kids who were di diagnosed with lead poisoning when they were born. Not when they were born, I'm sorry, when they were infants and toddlers. And they followed these kids for 20, 30 years. These are brain scans of 20 year old uh, young men and women right now. And it shows, and I'm gonna try to make this yoga work. And if I, if I blow something up, it's not my fault. I just, I'm from America. I don't know how to do things very well. Um, oh, it did work. Oh my God. Um, it shows this. So this, these red islands, right? Those red islands are in, in one location of your brain. These are slice throughs of uh, brain response time. Those are in your frontal cortex, right? Your, the, the, the part of your brain that only evolved about 2.4 million years ago and that separates us from early primates and from jellyfish. There's a lot of things that separate us from jellyfish, I understand. But um, it is the home of all of our executive functions. It's the home of our intelligence, our memory, our impulse control, um, our, uh, our intelli our, you know, our, frankly, our intelligence. When, when you have frontal cortex damage, your IQ, the, 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 one of the demonstrable aspects is that you do a long-term IQ test. Your IQ goes down, right? Which means your economic potential goes down, which means your likelihood to be incarcerated when you're a young person or as a young, young adult go up, right? So these are all linked together. These are kids, these red colors here are not where it's really flashing strong. It's where there's a neural deficit. In fact, neural voids, the neurons aren't there. They're not working. 
in the prefrontal cortex. Um, and the reason why this is profound is that that's a significant amount of brain loss, this permanent. The second is that these kids are 20 years old. They were exposed 18 years ago, 19 years ago as infants and toddlers. The reason why their damage is permanent is that um, when you're a toddler, you're busily forming your frontal cortex, right? You're making all, you're building neurons. Uh, we are not building neurons as we're sitting here. We might be trying to remember some things, but losing more, forgetting more things than we remember, right? But they are not, they're building their neural network, they're building their intelligence. So this shows that not only is this important, but it's permanent. These kids are permanently uh, impacted. In fact, there's evidence that even if you follow these kids, they stopped, they stopped the study when they were, the kids were about 22, 23, lack of funding. Uh, but they've continued some of these studies in New Zealand. And in New Zealand, uh, the Dunedin cohort, you see continued drop in IQ as people get to be 30, 40, 50 years old. And their consequent in, uh, economic potential has decreased as well. So I guess the takeaway is lead is bad. It's really bad if you're exposed as a young person. Um, and it's permanent. It gets in the body the way a lot of things do, but with young kids, it's a little bit different, right? Young kids um, breathe more and eat more than we do per unit mass. Um, uh, young kids consume a tremendous amount of dirt, believe it or not. The young kids are gross. I've had, I've had young kids and they're disgusting. They stick things in their mouth all the time. Uh, and so they do ingest a lot of uh, soil and dust actually. And that's the problem. It's a lot of the soil and dust is contaminated. Also, I don't know if you've seen young kids, they're very short, they're very low to the ground, uh, meaning they're also exposed just from that direct ground exposure. Uh, they have a couple other things going against them. Our intestines are super good at filtering out lead that we ingest. Young kids are not. They absorb about 80% of the lead they ingest. We only absorb about 5%. Uh, our intestines are just a little bit more advanced. And, um, and of course, this is the time when their brains are formed. Uh, lead doesn't, if you get exposed to the big dose of lead when you're a kid, an infant, it doesn't go away. Even if, um, you know, lead shows us this peak in your blood, our blood gets replaced every six weeks or so. That's why you can get, you know, fresh blood transfusions every six weeks or so, you know, give blood to the Red Cross or I don't know if you have Red Cross here. Yeah. Uh, but our bones, um, will last for about seven years or so. They get remodeled uh, over a seven year time frame. about uh, almost all of that that lead in your brain gets transferred to your bone. And so if you are, you can actually tell people, I can measure all your guys' bones, it'd be very painful with a bone dog biopsy. But likely if you live in a city, your lead is going to be higher than if you grew up in the country, even now, 20, 30, 50 years later. And so it's, it remains a, this gift that keeps on giving, unfortunately. Why is there so much lead? Well, you know why, we used it for everything for a long time. Uh, we use it in gasoline as an anti-knock agent. Uh, worst idea in the world, but you know, nevertheless, we stuck it in gasoline. Uh, we put it in paint, makes a very durable paint, also a terrible idea. Uh, and we put it on pipes in cities and towns. And if I have time afterwards, I'll talk about the pipe problem, um, also a terrible idea. So we have a hundred years of lead sitting out in the environment and it's not gone away. In fact, um, where is it? It's largely where there's a lot of people, where there's a lot of old structures, old meaning anything before about 1950 in the US. Australia and the US have pretty comparable lead standards um, when they started controlling it. So Australia, I think it's about the same, about 1970 for Australia. After that, there's no lead paint in new homes anymore. My house is from 1915 in Indiana. Actually, there hasn't been you know, lead paints legally sold for 50 years, but all of the paint in my house is lead paint. It's just now hidden behind uh, the fresh coat of paint. So it's all there. Um, and in fact, when I measure soils outside my house, soils are 10 times higher than natural, just because the old paint did slough off, right? Um, gasoline, we also got it out of, out of a gasoline. EPAs came around and made sure that we could no longer, um, you know, have belching lead, lead battery plants around in downtowns. But all of that lead was distributed usually atmospherically or on in the sheets of uh, buildings in cities and towns. And, mo and a lot of it has now accumulated in the surface soils. Um, and I, I'm gonna get to that point again in a little bit why surface soils matter, but a lot of it is just in the surface layer where unfortunately we live, right? Dust is generated from surface soils. Uh, we garden in surface soils. Um, kids play around in the playgrounds in surface soils, right? Um, and by surface, I really mean the upper uh, 20 centimeters or so. 
Well, I, you can, I can make those lists and tell you where it is, but, or I can actually show you actually where it is. These are parts of our citizen science networks where we've engaged with people that they actually take samples from yards. And this is the distribution in samples from yards. Chicago, Illinois, right? A very big city. The old, old core has a tremendously high soil lead values um, and the outside does not. Sydney, Australia, your own city. I could do the same thing for Newcastle, for Melbourne. We have maps of a lot of these cities in Australia also. My colleague, uh, Mark Taylor, we, and I, uh, formerly at Macquarie University, we partnered on this project together. Very high in the old part of Sydney. Um, New Orleans, similarly high in the old part of New Orleans. Uh, my city, even a small little town, South Bend, Indiana, only famous for uh, the home, the where Mayor Pete, Pete Buttigieg, who was like a maverick candidate for the last presidential election where he was mayor. Um, no one can pronounce his last name, so he's just called Mayor Pete. Uh, it's only famous for that and the Notre Dame football. Um, small town, yet it also has a lead problem. It's all the urban core. So it doesn't really matter the size or scale. It doesn't matter the country. Um, if you have an old city, you are going to find it in soils. And these are all surface soils. These are all citizen science collected upper five centimeter soils. Um, and it's still painted in the fabric of these communities. Um, well, you could say, well, that's all well and good. I mean, how many kids eat dirt? Well, first of all, a lot of kids do, um, but a lot of kids get exposed inadvertently through the dust that's generated from dirt. We were able to publish, uh, actually about 15 years ago now, a pretty definitive model where we were able to show that the majority of lead burden in kids is coming from dust is generated from surface soils during, particularly during dry periods of the, of the year. Um, and you can see this, um, we were talking about African, you know, landscape where it's, you know, monsoonally, it was seasonally uh, dry, tremendous amount of dirt, uh, dust is re-suspended re, re at that time. Uh, how does it get to kids? Well, it gets it through dust exposure. What does it look like in kids? This is what it looks like. This is a map of lead poison kids that we generated from Indianapolis, Indiana. We have 16,000 blood lead data points uh, that were um, geocoded down to the address level and mapped them. And this shows the texture of lead poisoning. This isn't lead poisoning from 50 years ago when we knew better, uh, before we knew better. Um, I can talk about that later on also, because we did know better, but uh, this is from the last 10 years. So this is a map of current lead poisoning in Indianapolis, Indiana. And you notice it's clearly not distributed homogeneously. It's distributed largely around the urban core. This, this big pile here is the urban core uh, with, a, with a, a gap here in the middle of the downtown city where our university is and uh, the, all the state buildings and our stadiums, sports stadiums are. The gap is there's no kids who live there. There's no registered home addresses at a university campus, obviously, or our state house. So um, there's some reasons why um, it's not one big bullseye, why there's a gap in the middle, but beyond that, um, it's on all of the all of the perimeters of our city, the older perimeters of our city. And if I so this is from the last ten years, not actually it's 2005 to 2015. Um, if you look at the same map from 20 years earlier, from 1990 or so, it looks the same. It's just the levels are fortunately have gotten a lot lower. So the the levels of lead poisoning has have gotten lower because we've gotten rid of it in gasoline, for example. But the spatial texture looks the same. I think that's the point. It, it, these communities are lead burden now, they're lead burden 20 years ago. And it's usually the same people who live in these communities. Generation after generation are lead burden. And they're usually in lower income communities. And a lot of these are lower income communities of color. So in the US context, that's largely African American communities and uh, Latinx communities. Um, and, and if you show this map to a public health expert, they would say, yes, this is terrible. Um, what is their response? If the child in one little house here is, shows up lead poisoned right there, they'll treat that one child in the one house. That's the mandate of our public health system. Will they treat the house next to it? Will they look to see if there's an issue? No, they have no money to do that and that's not their job. But this problem of Thousands of lead poison kids are not going to be fixed one house by one house. It has to be, have a, a more comprehensive risk-based approach to doing it. And the way we come in is I'm tired of showing a map of lead poison kids that's going to look the same generation after generation. Because I'd be here in 2040 
Um, I'm not going to make it probably till 2040, but let's just pretend I have another Fulbright and I come here. I'd show you that it would look the same, except maybe it'd be a little bit lower, right? Instead, we are actually being, using this map to get ahead of the game. And this is the, the hallmark of good environmental health. Public health has to serve the patient. I understand that. I get that. A clinician has to serve the patient in front of them. But we as environmental health people, we actually can get one step ahead of that because we know the environmental context for that. And all the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about my journey to get there. Um, we focused on one community first. That's our first pilot community. Um, and this is a community with elevated levels. Our university already had a partnership with this community, a very robust partnership with a largely African-American community. And we thought, okay, let's, let's approach this in a couple ways. First, let's engage with um, all the, the community leaders here to, to bring everything to bear. So what we sat down with them, we didn't lecture them about lead. We didn't show them a long, boring diagram. We instead said, we think lead is a problem in this community. Tell us what you think. Are you concerned about it? Uh, if you are, how can we help you? And using that approach, not lecturing at them like they're idiots, right? Uh, I hate to say it, but a lot of us professors, we don't lecture like they're idiots, but we're lecturing like we're explaining something to a, an audience who is waiting for it to be explained to them. Well, this is a community with their own um, understandings of how their community works, right? They know their own context. Um, no, they don't know the science of lead, but they don't really need to know the science of lead to get ahead of this issue of lead poisoning, which they did know about. So they said, you know what we should do, Gabe? Let's do this. Let's have our community centers collect soils. Let's um, work with two different high schools, local high schools, and have them collect high school kids who are from, from this area help collect soils. And let's get, um, we, we, had, we now have churches involved, but at that time we didn't. Let's get our gardening network to collect soils. And as a consequence, we got something like 250 soils collected in a, in a year. And this was a distribution. So we were able to do a kind of a much finer scale distribution than if I were just to go out and collect soils from the side of the road, which is all I'm legally allowed to do, right? I, I can't sneak into someone's yard and take their soils. I could knock on 2,000 doors. Um, and to be frank, me, a, 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 a white dude from the university knocking on an African-American person's door is not going to go well. Um, mainly because they distrust, you know, there's a, there's a pretty deep, profound level of distrust with institutions. And so, but in, instead it was them collecting. And, and instead of me just taking this data and publishing it in a journal, which I have, but my commitment to them was that I'm going to translate this, not dumb down the science, I'm going to translate this in a way that you can do something about it. So we said, okay, first things, there's, we've got some high priorities here. We have these three different community gardens, red, orange, uh, red, orange, and orange. By, by high levels, if you look at the scale, the normal amount of lead that should be in a soil is about 30 parts per million. Okay. These are close to 100 times that level. Okay. Um, and so we thought, okay, let's focus on these gardens and have them do gardening the right way to make sure that kids who are visiting those gardens, there's a lot of kids, student groups who visit the gardens to help, they're not being exposed to lead while gardening and that it doesn't get into the food. Uh, and next, let's focus on these areas where high school students took all these samples. And they picked this because there was an old lead smelting plant here, a battery recycling plant that had been closed down. It had been partially cleaned up. And you can see the cleanup is this, these little small yellow dots. They're not super high in lead. But any environmental scientist would tell you if they look at this map and saw these huge values, these huge values, these that they clearly did not make their perimeter, their cleanup perimeter big enough, right? They made that circle way too small to protect public health. And the reason why we knew this was also a problem is a lot of lead poisoned kids are from this area. So clearly their, their cleanup hadn't worked. Um, and in fact, a lot of these contaminated spots here were blowing lead back into these neighborhoods anyway. So their, their soil lead values had already tripled from the time that the clean dirt was put on them. So uh, the community here said, you know, Gabe, could you go and tell the EPA? And, and I said, well, you know what? I didn't collect these samples. I don't live here. You collected these samples. You live here. You know enough about lead exposure risks to contact the EPA. They have to listen to you. And they did. They contacted their, our EPA and said, we have real concerns. 
EPA took about a year to send anyone down. They doubted my our results, but um, never, they did a reanalysis and found out that yeah, there's a real lead issue here, um, and they recleaned it up. So the site is now cleaned up. This data was from five years ago. It's now so so because of I, I didn't just publish this data in a paper. I worked with the community to provide help them provide a voice that they could take action on. Because of that, it's had more impact than any one of my boring papers papers have ever had in a journal. Right? It's out there. It's actually changed practices. Um, there's a funny nuance. They actually couldn't clean it up on the context of lead, even though it's clearly you can see that it's lead contaminated. Because um, uh, companies are very smart at, at fighting against lead litigation because they say, well, there's a lot of lead sources in cities. It didn't have to be the smelting plant. Maybe it's paint. Maybe it's gasoline. But it had one secret ingredient, which is that the only thing that you can find in, in lead battery cycling that's um, this anomalous is antimony, an element that normally you wouldn't think of as a big issue, but it's a telltale sign of a lead smelting plant. And antimony actually has its own public health screening standard. I didn't know that. But so they actually cleaned this up, not on the basis of lead, but on antimony. Nevertheless, the result was the same. So I use a lesson, some lessons learned here, which is that um, when I came and lectured at the at the neighborhoods about these about this lead poisoning issue, I got nowhere. When I sat down and actually had a, a genuine conversation with them and had my students work with them, started to get somewhere. And then when I actually I got some, I'll show you in the next slide. I actually got a grant, and I gave half of the grant to a youth training program there to help them become environmental justice advocates, then boom, success happened. So it, it kind of, it takes a different perspective of taking yourself out of the driver's seat as a faculty member, as a university member, and you're more of a supporting role. You're trying to elevate communities. I'm not saying this is gonna work on every problem. It has worked on this problem at least. What did this inspire? It inspired us to go bigger with this. It inspired us to go national with a program that we started with Safe Gardening Initiative. It's just people like to garden in cities. I know in uh, Australia, it's a big thing, you know, like well, home, home based gardens. And uh, my colleague Mark has done the same kind of thing. It's embraced that he calls his program Veggie Safe, but embrace this concept that, well, you can engage actually gardeners as your citizen scientists and great educators too. So. Uh, we got funding to, to launch this initiative. Um, we now have, even from our city alone, over 2,000 properties have been tested for lead. As along, We test for a bunch of other metals, but people aren't so interested in, in those. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we funded a youth, uh, youth training program, and this was some of their work as they went out in, the, in communities and um, helped uh, get, get samples themselves. They actually also produced a bunch of video content. So it's not, you know, the white dude lecturing about lead. It's actually, uh, in this case, that's Chio. Chio did a great demonstration of how you sample for lead um, and how you collect the samples and how you, you know, how you arrange them in bags. It's, scientifically, it's probably not the most accurate thing, but it's good. It does. It does. It's the job done, right? Um, speaking about getting the job done, they also came up with some phenomenal innovations that uh, were not ones that I created at all. And this comes. Part of the innovation you get from community knowledge. One of them is that um, they realize that cold calling, even though they were uh, basically the same how their African American youth corps, they wore official t-shirts, even them knocking on doors got people flagged. So they realized we get turned away from people who we know want to be involved. In so instead they said, Gabe, can we do a, a door flyer like they do for if you want a um, mosquito sprayed or you know, or get a free pizza or whatever? Can we do a door flyer and say, um, here's what we are. We're going to come by tomorrow. Um, and if you want us to knock on the door, just leave the flyer. Up. And so we had pretty good success rate with that. Uh, and the second thing they did was the most innovative thing I've heard is that they'd heard me talk about the fact that I was really concerned about exposure, lead exposure in daycares. Um, you have the same, I'm sure you have the same daycare system here for little kiddos. Parents are working. In the U.S., there's a range of them. You know, there's there's um, there's licensed daycares that have to certify, and they have to show. You know, someone comes by and make sure that you know there's not electrical wires hanging out the walls, right? Uh, but there's a tremendous number of unlicensed daycares in a lot of these lower income communities. Why are they unlicensed? They can't afford the licensing. Okay. If they were to afford the licensing, 
they would have the city come out and test their soil lead in the playground. That's part of that's part of the licensure. If you have little kids in an environment, you actually have to hit that certain lead standard. They didn't, and I was worried that these this is where a lot of kids were getting lead exposed. A tremendous number of people use these informal daycares. Um, and I explained that you know the solution to most lead exposure is not to remove all the soil for $2 million an acre, um, which is how much it costs. Instead, the, the, the pretty quick solution is add uh, wood chips, add about 10 inches, six inches of wood chips, or do some other kind of mulching, whether it's green mulching or wood chip mulching, to separate the kid from the soil. If the source of the, of the exposure is dust generated from the soil or sometimes direct contact with soil, seal it off. And the, it's, yes, that's not a permanent solution. But even by sealing it off, you're getting some dilution factor, right? As a mulch decays, it's already reducing the lead content by half. Let's seal it off. It's, it solves the problem, at least for today, for those kids today. So the kids knew all this. It was only two years ago that they told that the director of this program said, you know what, by the way, do you know what they, our kids did? I'm like, no. They, decided, they took this two tidbits, which is seal it off the, le the lead and you'll, you'll at least uh, protect those kids now. And... Unlicensed daycares do not want someone taking soil samples from them because they're worried that then, guess what? They'll be found in violation of a number of laws. Um, so they decided, well, they've got access to your truck and free wood chips. You call it mulch here also, or wood, you know, you get the idea. Um, and they had a mulch day where they went to the, these unlicensed daycares, knocked on the door and said, hey, we're, um, we are doing a, a neighborhood beautification project. And we're going to do it next Saturday. Would you like to be involved? 100% of them said yes. So they went there. And much to my chagrin, they didn't take samples because they didn't want this to be a punitive thing. They just pumped mulch down. 100% um, success rate in this mulching project, which meant that there's at least, there's about 20 kids per, these 20. So about 400 kids who were immediately protected from any potential lead exposure risk. We didn't verify there was one, but that's that these kids had a more practical approach. Like this is not always about science. You know, sometimes this is about helping kids right now where they need it. And the big obstacle is, you know, the people there don't have a truck to haul mulch. They've got 5 million other things they're doing, like looking after a bunch of kids. Um, and so this was considered a, a beautification project. So just a brilliant idea. It had nothing to do with me. Um, but these are these funny effects that a little bit of knowledge I mean, as, as instructors, we all see this with students who go on in their career. Little things you say can make a big difference. But in this case, it's a little bit of facts can help a community actually elevate itself. Um, this inspired us to launch a national and global program called Map My Environment. If you're interested, it's mapmyenvironment.com, all one word. Uh, and, uh, ha and stimulate us to reach out beyond just soil as we're actually curious what are people's generally exposures inside and outside their homes? Um, and uh, we partnered with uh, Mark Taylor at Macquarie um, to start bringing this international. Uh, and so our first target was what we've all, always been super good at. It was just measuring soil, soil lead. It's not hard to do. Uh, but it's similarly not hard to do dust lead either. Same, same approach. Uh, nor is it hard to do paint lead. So we added these media to map my environment. So people, there's a clear instructions, there's videos on, on how, do you, how do you prevent exposure, but there's clear instructions on if you're in this country, here's how you take samples and here's who you send it to. And here's what you can expect for results. We have an automated system now in our lab process. We, we process something about 120 samples a week. Um, when the data is logged in every Sunday, it, kicks, it auto generates a report which is very simple, red, yellow, green. If you're all green on soil, dust, paint, and now we've added water, you're good to go. If you show up in the yellow or red, then we start giving you advice, right? But, um, and frankly, about 15 to 20% of people do show up in the, in the orange, yellow and red. Um, people all understand traffic lights, um, and so it, it, it works. So it sort of auto generates and it maps, it produces these maps. Is this, hopefully this is a map? No, but you look, thought back about the map of Sydney where it showed the distribution. Um, I can chance having a big disaster with these buttons. Um, nevertheless, here it is. It, um, it then, you know, their results went every week, 
new results are added up for each city, uh, added onto the map. Uh, people are a little bit funny about having a, an environmental result tied to their home address because you can you can zoom zoom in on this, zoom out. You can add all kinds of layers. So we we jitter this data the minute the sample comes in and is logged on on our computer. It's transported to the. This is all done on a on a shiny app service done on another server. The data is transmitted to another server, having its location um, jittered by up to 150 degrees in a random direction. So once that happens, you cannot tell it, your, your, your own personal data is not in a public repository anymore. That's what people were worried about that. People were worried about having their data in, you know, tied to their home address as, in a hackable way. You know, nowadays, you know, any, any publicly acceptable data sharing platform, it's all hackable. We all know that now because everything's hacked. Uh, not, I don't know why someone would want to hack this, but nevertheless, um, we provide that sense of assurance to people. We jitterate 150 meters, uh, uh, up to 150 meters, and then we second jitter it every time this page is refreshed. So this page not only doesn't have the address in it anymore, it has some random address pretty close to the house, but then it's auto jittered every time this is reloaded. So you can't sort of spend time narrowing down on someone's house address. Again, why someone would do that, I have no idea, but people feel reassured that their data is protected. Happy then to talk a little bit more about the back end unless it involves all of the ARB programming that, that went in behind us, I can't tell you anything. Um, we have now um, started, we got really into this educational part um, is like, let's take this program and not just have it for people, but let's, let's have it start introducing into school curriculum. Because kids, there's a new generation of kids who are super interested in the environment, at least in the US, and sustainability and all that. And urban sustainability depends a lot on urban quality, air, water, and soil, right? You know, that's, that's what makes a vibrant and, and, and healthy city. So we've added a couple other components. Um, but before I get there, sorry, um, the, one of the, this, this whole thing is, has exploded recently with an article in Washington Post where we, um, where we also recognize that we can do a, we can store all of these samples on dust that we have um, and we can add other analysis after. We only give them the metal analysis. Um, we can add allergen analysis, right? People are concerned about allergens, right? We still have their address. We still can contact them. So as we add a new analytical tool, like uh, 23andMe, that genetic thing, we can update it and say, hey, by the way, we now have another capability. Would you like to get your results? Uh, we have, um, have colleagues now, by the way, I said, I say this like, you know, we can really do this. We can, we haven't done this yet. So sorry, this is a bit of false advertising. We have done these two. Uh, we have um, uh, antimicrobial resistance gene study, a sub, sub study in the UK, where we're looking at people's home dust and how much antimicrobial resistance they have inside their home environment, which is a big deal with allergens. Uh, we've added on PFAS, so we're beginning, uh, uh, this is the so-called forever chemical, a human-produced chemical that's now in you, in every one of you, um, in your food and air and, and water. We don't know what it does. It causes cancer, but um, we don't know if that's a environmentally relative, relevant factors. And we also um, can use uh, organic, com volatile organic compounds. And, um, and uh, we, we published a, a, a fun little paper about that last year, about seeing how much during the middle of the COVID lockdown, I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming you guys were doing the same thing. People were going loony before we knew this was mainly airborne and mainly through direct respiratory. Everyone was cleaning off everything with sterilizing agents. You know, so every, you know, you'd leave your packages outside the door for two days and then you'd sterilize them down. Well, people were loading their interior houses with um, volatile organic compounds from these cleaning products. Uh, I don't know if there's any chemists in this room, but particularly one um, it's called quark, it's a quaternary ammonium compound. It's quite toxic, actually. The, um, on average, people doubled their concentration of quarks inside homes during the COVID lockdown. From, so they were killing themselves by avoiding COVID, which is kind of ironic. Um, if you go to our map now, you'll see something like this, um, where you can uh, zoom in on various things. This is our soil um, layer. Uh, we have partners in the UK, UK and, and um, Africa. Uh, my lab is the North American hub where you have something like um, 2,100 homes in cities and another 11,000 distributed across the country and similar to Australia. Uh, 
we've been starting to use this as to develop from a public health perspective, a, um, a, a risk avoidance app. So you might ask, well, should I be worried about lead? It's the most common question that I get asked. Should I get, be worried about this? Um, we now have, a, a, we just published it last month, an app system so that you can just use your phone and go through a couple criteria. My home is this year. My, I live in this kind of area and I'll show you the relative risk level and then give you directions on how you get lead tests, um, if it's an issue or not. So it's, um, the reason being, of course, is that in about 80% of the cases, it's not an issue. 80% of homes do not have a lead issue, but about 20% do. And in cities, that's probably a little bit more than that. Um, oh, this is the fun little study that we did on disinfectants, us killing ourselves, avoiding killing ourselves uh, from other things. But um, I'm gonna focus in, just wrap this up with uh, my example from my own city, Indianapolis, uh, where we are starting to now think about how our data can inform environmental justice questions. We've already, you know, we already have an, a disproportionate focus of our program on lower income communities. But when we do an overlay between where we have samples and the percent poverty in the city, it's not a great, we, we're not actually doing super good with risk. The darker the gray, the higher the risk of poverty in, in the, of a household in poverty in Indianapolis. So we've done a pretty good job matching this, but not exactly. So we're using this socioeconomic status map to develop additional programs. One of them is focused exactly on this area. Oh, I pushed the wrong button. So if I can, um, it's focused on this area, the near north side, where it's zero samples. And now we actually have a ton. This is from about six months ago. And the reason why that focus is, is we got a couple of schools that we partnered with. So we have a relatively large grant from our housing agency to add in water school, uh, I mean, water samples in this. Water is a big, lead exposure from water is a big issue. Flint, Michigan was a thing. Uh, and there's a lot of Flint, Michigans out there waiting to happen, unfortunately. Um, but we wanted to make this fun for kids. And so we know that actually earthworms can be pretty good biomonitors of soil, right? They chug along and they chew soil. And we've done analysis that the old, that the earthworms who live in lead, sat, more lead saturated areas have higher lead values. And, uh, we, ha we have to dry them up and grind them and analyze them. But, um, so we know that. So the good bio, bio indicators. We also know that kids are gross uh, for many reasons I've mentioned earlier, but they love picking up worms and they love having this as part of a school program. So this is now, a, we have it in a uh, pilot in five schools now where we hand out desk pin kits. Um, all it is is kitty litter in a small little plastic bag, uh, pet, pet litter in a small plastic bag and, and a soil, uh, three soil bags. And the schools, they make it a school contest. So the kids collect worms and soil from where they collected the worms um, and send it to us. Uh, and the more worms they collect, as they, they hit a certain threshold, we have a partnership with a local um, uh, local bookstore, bookstore, so they get a certificate for free book. Um, and the teachers are building it into their curriculum so they can talk about nature, they can talk about environmental exposure, and they can satisfy the needs of gross kids who would love nothing more than to pick worms off the sidewalks, frankly and geocode them, you know, so they map them, they take a picture of the worm and all kids have phones nowadays. Um, and, uh, and we call it the bookworms initiative. And it serves two purposes. Um, one of them is, uh, is that, you know, we use worms as a, as a biomonitor, but um, we also provide a free book for kids who participate. So bookworms um, and bookworms are also obviously the term for geeks and nerds, but, it's also what we found is there's only, there's been very little um, inter, post exposure interventions for lead. So ways to improve your outcomes other than edu educational uh, uh, mitigation. So reading, oddly enough, if it's kids in the same, has the same number, number of lead exposure as, a, as an infant and toddler and young adult, the kid who's been in a home where reading is more of a factor um, has better educational outcomes. And it makes a sense, we've done this with a lot, I haven't, but real doctors have done this um, uh, with uh, you know, various other brain damage issues. Is it kids can rewire their brains, you know, even with neural loss, their brains are still pretty plastic. And so they can rewire and reading helps the rewiring process in a way, because it's using all of the frontal cortex, right? It's focusing in on exactly the thing you need, more so than sport alone. Sport alone doesn't you know, always touch on that. 
So um, it's been a super fun project to run. Um, a lot of worms in the lab now, which is kind of an odd thing to have in a lab where I'm used to rocks and soil, but it's a pretty simple kit. Um, kids can actually, as part of the curriculum, kids identify the different kinds of earthworms. There's different worms. Apparently, I don't like worms very much, but there's all different kinds of earthworms, and they seem to respond all the same to lead exposure. Um, we are now doing, um, this is the last, I think, hopefully the last slide I'll burden you guys with, but um, we're realizing there's another biosentinel that people are crazy about. Um, people are crazy about birds. You know, there's a whole birder community in the U.S. and I'm, oh, globally, and so they keep very good bird counts. Um, it ends up that some birds, like the American robin, um, in, in, for about one month of the year, they dine completely off of earthworms. Um, other times of year, they, they don't, they're in other places. But uh, we have, I have a colleague who, um, who captures these birds and, and takes a little bit of blood. We don't kill them, you just take a little bit of blood. And so um, our, my first students, they just presented their work a month ago. I wasn't there, obviously. But where they linked soil lead, worm lead, and robin blood lead together. Um, and it's a really cool way. I think you can transcend, you know, soil is static. It only stays pretty much right here, except for dust. Worms move around a little bit. So they mine, you know, so they are an indicator of a certain area. Robins are an indicator of a broader geographic scope. So you can kind of figure out the lifetime loading. These um, birds have a fair amount of lead in them too. More so than a lot of kids. I don't know if it affects them. Birds are not very smart, um, but I've not seen a bird read. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it's, they are indicators and who knows, there might be some neurological issues. I know that urban lead gets high enough for urban chickens often to poison and kill them. Um, so that is, can become an issue. The reason why we also know that this public engagement is really important for communities is that they're tired of having research done on them. They, uh, they would prefer to have it done with them and for them in, in partnership and partnership. And so we, uh, we summarized this work in a paper in December uh, that showed that the self-efficacy part, this part that I made a point of earlier on about this community group um, making a call to the EPA themselves, not having me do it, the self-efficacy can actually make a huge difference in community, um, the trajectories of communities. Um, we don't recognize it often from mid and upper class communities because all of that is sort of built in. You know, we all vote. If we find an environmental problem, we'll complain and it'll be fixed tomorrow. Um, a lot of these communities do not have the same, aren't afforded the same set of uh, pre-advantages that we have, right? Um, oh, this is, sorry, this was um, a, a funny little, I, I think I gave this for the Newcastle uh, group uh, last week, but um, we're, we're doing this in Newcastle uh, now a little bit, where we actually do have some uh, soils. I don't know if you've been to Newey before, but this is um, uh, downtown, uh, old Newcastle. Um, and this is soils and that's the dust, uh, but we're, we're trying to augment um, our data array there. Um, and we're taking advantage of a, not, not a tragic fire, a huge fire that happened right after I got here. I didn't set the fire, I promise, but it was an old building, an old wool handling building uh, that was being converted over to apartments. Nobody lived there, nobody was hurt at all, but it's, it's spewed an incredible amount of ash and dust in the community. And that it was old enough building that it likely had, well, actually we know it has a fair amount of lead paint. And we sort of modeled this around a study that we did in the US that showed that house fires can actually distribute because um, you know, when a house burns, it's very hot and it distributes, it wafts the, um, the, the dust smoke and a lot of even paint chips pretty far away from the source. So even if they clean up the house, there's actually a lot of stuff that gets scattered in the neighborhood. It could be, could be a concern. So um, to recap, I think that we've been pretty successful at developing novel ways to map the distribution of contaminants um, and, and develop a couple different ways of transforming science in our context. I'll tell you, I have the benefit of working in a university that has supported this stuff from the get-go. We have a fellowship only about community engagement, exclusively about that. $50,000 fellowship, you can use it however you want. That's how I funded one of my, um, uh, one of my projects. But if you try to do a citizen science proposal into like a like your equivalent ARC, for example, which is one of your funding agency equivalents, I have the same equivalent here. It's likely to you know go over like a lead balloon, quite literally, even if it's about lead. Um, not particularly, it doesn't really find a great audience because it fits in between a terrible niche between environmental science and health science. 
and the U.S., the agencies that fund that and the agencies that act on it are completely separate. There's like, and, and the students who are educated in those are completely separate. It's like a huge dividing line, a huge brick wall between the two. Part of one of my institutes that I run is trying to break down that brick wall, but it's slow. It is literally brick by brick, having to work with funding agencies and say, you guys need to, need to get together. And, and, and we, it finally resonated. Our, our big funding agencies, National Science Foundation, they requested from, from us, from GeoHealth, a, a roadmap to do better. Um, and which we sent to them last week, you know, here's how you do better. And it's not just putting more money at the problem. It's funding the next funding um, research projects that are novel. It's training the next generation of students and breaking down some of those silos. Um, it is um, it is better venues for publishing citizen science. And frankly, it's better ways to reward people. If I'm a, a young assistant professor, a young lecturer, and my area is in, you know, lead geochemistry, in the U.S., if I were to devote my next five years to developing a community science project and go up for advancement on that, I'd be turned down. If I were to spend that five years developing some new geochemical technique, guess what? I'd probably be advanced. Um, and it's just that strict as we don't, um, we don't have a great way to help inspired students become inspired young colleagues, become inspired senior colleagues. You know, we don't have a pipeline yet, and it's not going to be easy to build. And it's probably different in the US than it is in Australian context, no question. Uh, but nevertheless, it's an aspirational goal. So um, obviously you're not in, in Newcastle, so you can't visit me in person, but you have me here. Uh, do visit the site, uh, mapmyenvironment.com. Uh, if you want to play around with Twitter with me, that's me and also direct email. So thank you so much for your attention. And hopefully I haven't taken too much time away from questions.